My name is Charlie Reardon. I'm a member of the Division of Urogynecology at Women and Infants Hospital and Alpert Medical School of Brown University. This presentation is based on a publication entitled Behavioral Training with and Without Biofeedback in the Treatment of Urge Incontinence in Older Women, a Randomized Controlled Trial, which was published in JAMA in November 2002 by Catherine Bergio et al. This presentation was developed and produced with funding from Pfizer, Inc. Biofeedback-assisted behavioral training for urge incontinence includes teaching patients how to identify and exercise the pelvic floor muscles and how to use them to prevent urine loss by aborting detrusor contractions and occluding the urethra during contractions that cannot be inhibited. There is evidence that behavioral training with biofeedback is safe and effective in patients with urge urinary incontinence, but it has not been established that biofeedback is an essential component of this approach or whether muscle control can be taught by other methods. This study was conducted to evaluate the relative effects of behavioral training with and without biofeedback compared with a self-administered behavioral treatment control for urge incontinence in community-dwelling women of at least 55 years of age. This prospective randomized controlled trial was conducted between April 1, 1995 and March 30, 2001. The setting was a university-based outpatient clinic in the United States. Patients were a voluntary sample of community-dwelling older women recruited through local advertisements, community outreach, and professional referrals. Eligibility included age at least 55 years and predominant urge incontinence that occurred at least two times per week, persisting for at least three months. A clinical evaluation was conducted for patients meeting initial entry criteria that included urodynamic testing to document bladder dysfunction and to classify the type of incontinence. Current medication was not reported as a factor for eligibility or patient stratification. Patients were excluded if they had continual leakage, post-void residual urine volume greater than 150 milliliters, severe uterine prolapse, decompensated congestive heart failure, or impaired mental status. Eligible patients were randomized to behavioral treatment with biofeedback, behavioral treatment without biofeedback, or verbal feedback based on vaginal palpation, or a control condition of self-administered behavioral training. Two-week bladder diaries were used to measure pretreatment frequency of incontinence. The Hopkins Symptoms Checklist, the Incontinence Impact Questionnaire, and the Short Form Health Survey were completed at baseline. Following the last intervention visit, patients completed two weeks of post-treatment bladder diaries. These materials were collected at a post-treatment visit, and urodynamic testing was repeated at that time. For all patients, treatment was implemented for eight weeks, and daily bladder diaries were completed throughout this eight-week treatment period. For patients randomized to the behavioral training with biofeedback group, treatment consisted of four clinic visits at two-week intervals during the eight-week period. Clinic staff reviewed bladder diaries at each visit, and interventions were implemented by nurse practitioners. During visits, patients were taught skills and strategies for preventing incontinence and provided with oral and written instruction for daily home practice. At the initial visit, anal rectal biofeedback a three-balloon probe inserted rectally for measuring external anal sphincter responses and rectal abdominal pressures, was used to help patients identify pelvic floor muscles and teach them how to contract and relax these muscles selectively. The next visit helped patients respond adaptively to the sensation of urgency using urge suppression strategies. At the third clinic visit, patients who had not achieved at least 50% improvement underwent bladder sphincter biofeedback in order to teach them how to contract pelvic floor muscles against increasing volumes of liquid in the presence of increasing urgency and during detrusor contraction. The fourth clinic visit was devoted to reviewing progress, fine-tuning home practice, and supporting persistence in the use of behavioral strategies. Pelvic floor exercise recommendations included 45 exercises each day, sets of 15 exercises three times daily. The behavioral training without biofeedback intervention included all of the components described for the behavioral training minus the biofeedback. Instead of biofeedback, verbal feedback based on vaginal palpation was used in the first treatment session to help patients identify and contract pelvic floor muscles. If patients had not improved by at least 50% by their third clinic visit, the teaching from the first session was repeated. Home practice and other instructions were the same as described for the biofeedback group. The control group received written instructions for an eight-week, step-by-step, self-help behavioral program 
with the same content as the other training programs, but completely self-administered without the benefit of professional expertise or equipment. Patients in this group were provided with a supply of bladder diaries and stamped envelopes for returning the completed diaries bi-weekly. Of 474 women who were evaluated clinically, 222 were randomized to one of three intervention groups. The women ranged in age from 55 to 92 years. Before treatment, there were no differences among the treatment groups on key parameters except for bladder capacity. The mean bladder capacity was 282 milliliters, 238 milliliters, and 266 milliliters for the biofeedback, verbal feedback, and self-help booklet groups respectively. Before treatment, the mean number of incontinence accidents per week was similar across the three groups, ranging from 15.1 to 17.3. Following treatment, the mean number of accidents was reduced to 6.1, 6.0, and 6.7 in the biofeedback, verbal feedback, and self-help booklet groups, respectively. Behavioral treatment with biofeedback resulted in a mean 63.1% reduction in the frequency of accidents. Behavioral treatment with verbal feedback was associated with a 69.4% reduction in accident frequency. And self-help resulted in 58.6% reduction in accidents. According to the analysis of covariance, the three groups were not significantly different. There were small but non-significant variations in the percentage of patients who achieved at least 50% or 75% reduction in incontinence following eight weeks of treatment. Limitations to this study should be noted. This study was focused on the treatment of urge incontinence, and the results should not be generalized to stress incontinence. The patient population was a volunteer sample recruited through local advertisements and community outreach. These patients may be particularly motivated to engage in behavioral training for urge incontinence and may not be representative of the overall population with urge incontinence. Current medication use was not reported, and it is unclear what role medications might play in the study outcomes. Biofeedback to teach pelvic floor muscle control, verbal feedback based on vaginal palpation, and self-administered behavioral training based on a self-help booklet all achieved notable improvements in urge incontinence in older, community-dwelling women. Behavioral training with biofeedback and behavioral training with verbal feedback had almost identical rates of incontinence as documented in bladder diaries after treatment, indicating that biofeedback did not enhance the efficacy of behavioral training.